Tail Swan, I am so excited to be talking with you today. Thank you so much for being on my podcast. It's such an honor and a privilege to be speaking with you. How is everything today? <laughs> it's an interesting day. You know, the holidays aren't exactly a, a really lovely time for all people. And I tend to be the one that answers mostly to the people who are suffering. So this was a, a week full of struggle. Oh, wow. Interesting. So people come to you. Do you have more people that come to you for guidance during the holidays? Yeah. And it's more, I mean, obviously I have a very large worldwide following that I try to keep my eye on as best as I can. And you can definitely see that during holiday time, there's a peak in the amount of struggle that people are dealing with, especially with family dynamics that they're stepping back into. Yes. I do have to say when the day after Christmas, I was reflecting on it and I was talking, I was having a conversation with someone and I said, you know, I'm so lucky and I'm so grateful that there's never any drama in my family. There's no, nobody fights. It's all just very peaceful and we have a good time and, and all of that. And it's really great because I know that that's a trigger for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of families are not that peaceful. <laughs> no, they're not. Well, I'm so happy that there's people like you to help so many people that may be struggling and have a, a person that they can lean on and, and have you help and inspire people. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So what is your backstory? Everybody has a story. And in your bio, you kind of alluded that there was some childhood stuff. Um, I tend to be a podcast host. I do a little bit of research with my guests, but I like I like the spontaneity of hearing things for the first time. So I kind of like to go in a little cold because I'm not a good actress, I guess. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So tell me, tell me your story. How did you get to where you are today? Okay, I'm going to try to do the Cliff's Notes version because um, it's very long. time. <laughs> <laughs> I was born a little different, right? Um, I was born extrasensory, and a lot of that is awesome. I mean, it comes with the ability to see things that are beyond this dimension, but a lot of that is really terrible. And I was struggling a lot of um, because of that as a kid, right? And my parents were struggling because they were not into spiritual stuff at all. They were very scientific people. So to have this kid that was like all of a sudden talking about aura colors and, you know, how dead people are talking to me. I mean, my parents were like, what are we doing with this child? You know. <laughs> so I think the story, my, my childhood story starts a lot with that struggle. And it's important to understand when you want to know how it is I ended up where I am right now to understand that I stepped into this world on more of a spiritual footing. So you could think of this as me having one foot in and one foot out of this life a little bit. Wow. The problem, though, also happened because of that, like because I had one foot in and one foot out and my parents decided to take a job in rural Utah where they were not aware of the, um, let's say, religious homogeny <laughs> that goes on in Syria. They didn't realize that it would be such a challenge for me and they didn't understand how I was going to be received. So I wasn't received well. Um, these types of abilities that I have are considered powers of priesthood to the Mormon church, to the, the, FLDS, oh, okay. the LDS and FLDS believe that this is a, a essentially a power of priesthood. The problem is that the powers of priesthood is something that is passed from God to Joseph Smith, their prophet to men. Mm -hmm. So, so because it was a little girl who was exhibiting these abilities, all of a sudden it was like, you know, this is a sign of the second coming. This is not good. This is like the devil's work. So the, um, the I created a stir now, my presence created quite a stir in this, like, very small town where I was raised. And pretty much everybody adapted to it in their own way. A lot of people were, like, turn the other cheek. A lot of people were writing my parents' letters about how I am never to step foot around their children and cannot come inside their houses and all this. But the problem is, is that, you know, ideologies that are like that, they breed a lot of, of deviance, quite frankly. And... Mm -hmm. So in this area, you know, you've got sort of like your mainstream LDS people, but then you've also got all these offshoots. And in these offshoot religions, there's a lot of extremism, right? So most people around the world are, are familiar with the FLDS um, because they saw the whole scandal with Warren Jeffs and things like that. And they're all about, you know, they understand polygamy, but there are, there are different offshoots from the uh, Mormon religion. And one of those is the Blood Covenant, which is a group that believes that 
when Jesus died on the cross, his his death did not pay for the sins of all man. That there are some oh. sins which must be paid for by the blood of man. So, hmm. so one of their prophets, um, Brigham Young, who was the one that brought the Mormons to Utah, right. taught a lot about this, about the fact that if, if somebody commits adultery, if you love him, you'll kill him, for example. So just like the wow. FLDS have stayed true to these teachings of polygamy, the blood covenant has stayed true to the original teachings around blood atonement. But I mean, the problem with that is that it opens the door for people with deviant psychology to step into that religious practice as a way of exercising their deviance. So there was a, there was a, de a man who was a deviant in the local area who participated in that particular cult but really to exercise the fact that he had multiple personalities and was a psychopath. And I got on his radar and he decided to infiltrate my family to pose himself as a mentor of mine. And then for the period of 13 years from age six to 19, I was richly tortured by this man. Oh my God. Yeah. Like really, really horrific stuff, which is why the details are mostly left out because a lot of people seem to get lost in my childhood story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you really, I mean, no, I, and I'm so sorry that you had to endure that. And you're right because that, you know, while, while that's extremely tragic and, and traumatic, you have to move forward, right? At some point. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Wow. Wow. So, so you, when you first started out, what do you call yourself again? Because I, I am not familiar with that term. A new thought leader. A new thought leader, but you used a different term. Well, like in the beginning from, from what? Yeah. I, oh, yeah. That, um, so what I use, what I think what I use is extrasensory. So extrasensory. It, okay. That's it, yes. I have heard of that. Right. Yeah. So what are some of the... So, okay, so you're you a little girl and you're, you're seeing auras and everything. Did you understand what that was or like, did you just have a knowing, like, like yeah, you knew what it was or? I understood some of it. Some of it, my, okay. some of it I didn't. Like some of it I was struggling with and some of it was just normal. The same way that you, you know, don't freak out when you see a dog, you know? Right. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I... I I used to, you know, I used to do a lot of energy work and things like that. And it was, that's, it was a very, very long time ago for me. Um, I'm not one that can see auras. Um, is it something that you're usually born with or can people develop that skill? I mean, like I've heard that people can develop that as a skill. It's just, it, it does better when people are trying to understand me specifically to think of this more like a disability than an ability. Because, because we could say that any disability that a person has makes it so that they have almost this open door to other ways of seeing the world, which could be considered a gift. Mm -hmm. The reason that you would consider what happened with me a disability is that most people, when they come into the physical dimension, they're able to fully plug in. It's almost like if you were to go be a part of a video game, imagine you could fully plug in and then you are the avatar in the game. I was never able to fully plug in, which is why this is considered a disability. It just gives me the capacity to comprehend the person sitting on the couch and to not lose track of that whole reality at the same time. Interesting. Interesting. So, so how do you use, and I'm going to call it your abilities because okay. <laughs> that's how I see it. How do you use your abilities to help others? Well, there's a lot of knowledge about this greater universe that comes with these abilities things okay. that you are, you just know the same as if you were not able to fully plug into your avatar in a video game, if you were aware of the you that's sitting on the couch, you would have an awareness of this whole world that other people don't. Right. right. So, so I have all kinds of awarenesses to why life, you know, what the purpose of the, the universe is, what the key to human happiness is, how mental and emotional patterns feed into physical ailments, for example. And there's, there's just a vast ocean of information that I'm basically getting all the time, which helps immensely, especially when people don't know why it is that they're struggling and don't mm -hmm. see the way out. Okay. You said a couple of things that's really piqued my interest there. So what is the universe all about? 
in terms of the purpose or in terms of its yeah. focus or? Yeah. Like I, I'm just curious. I mean, I have my understanding of it, but I'm curious like what you're like, how you see things because you obviously see things a little bit differently. So what is your perception and, and the things that you know that you can share with the audience that would help them to shift their perception? All kinds of things. Like the first, oh, thing I'm sure. I, the first thing that I would want people to understand is that you cannot separate yourself from the greater universe. It's not like the universe is some big being that then molds you as a separate thing from itself. It's more like a process of fragmentation whereby the greater universe fractures off aspects of itself, which is you now, right? Or anything else in existence. And so it is, it is almost perceiving itself through you. So a lot of the expansion of the universe itself is taking place by virtue of the things that you find out and the desires that you are broadcasting forth into the universe. So there's a very dynamic relationship happening between non-physical and physical life, spiritual and, and uh, let's call it temporal life, that if people were aware of it, they could engage more in that, that relationship. Um, and everything about the way that a human is designed is designed with that in mind. I mean, our entire emotional system was designed as that kind of a feedback relationship loop with the greater universe. So that the expansion happens by virtue of a person following what feels right or good to them specifically. So when when you make you know happiness or let's say your your personal life satisfaction the aim of your life, you're enhancing the expansion of this universe. So a lot of people are walking through this earth almost like wondering whether they're meant to suffer. You know. Is right. this what is this God's will for me? I hear that a lot. Like, is it God's will that I just sort of suffer? And the answer is no, but it, it is in the following of your joy or the closest that you can come to that, that the universe seeks and experiences its own expansion. So this universe wants your happiness ultimately. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I, I totally believe that. So how can somebody, if they, if they feel like they're struggling what can you say to them to help them to make that shift? Oh. <laughs> this is a hard one to generalize because it's so different based on what somebody is suffering with. Um, sure. No, that makes sense because there's, there's all sorts of different struggles. Let's just say someone, let's just say someone is struggling with, let's use a, a common one. Okay. that a lot of women go through is that, you know, women, they, they compare themselves to others. They're not, they don't feel good enough. They don't have the confidence, even though they may appear to be a confident woman. Um, it's, I, I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So what, if somebody's struggling with that, what, is there anything that you can help them oh, yeah. to, to help them make that shift? Yeah, to, to make that shift, you have to look genuinely at values in the face. Mm. You don't usually look values straight in the face. And what I mean by that is that we tend to make the assumption because we're fed all day long by society that certain values are more important than other values. We make the assumption that that's just the way it is without realizing that a value is only a value based on a need. Mm. So anytime that, that society transforms in some way, or experiences something different, like a war, the need within society changes. The second the need within society changes, their values change. Because a value is what is perceived to be important or something that holds value, right? So which is why, like, let's say during wartime, um, during wartime, all of a sudden, things like gold are worth nothing, because you can't do anything with that. Things like alcohol shoot through the roof. That's just like a basic understanding. But we can apply this to our relationships and to to our um, ability to fit within any particular group by understanding that any group of people or any person as an individual will have a specific value based off of what they specifically need. And, and if we understand this, all of a sudden it opens the door to be looking directly at what it is within us that we may be good at, what it is within us that holds some kind of a value. We have got to actually look for those and then look for where that is wanted. So when I'm dealing with people that are struggling with, with this the whole concept of not feeling good enough or like almost competing against others for what's valuable about them is I tell them the story about, about a horse in a car park. 
So I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with, maybe somebody who's watching this is going to be familiar with Secretariat, who was like the best race horse in history. St like okay. that, that was still never, I mean, that horse has still never been defeated. It's the kind of thing where the gap that horse left between every other horse was like, I mean, still to this day, nobody understands it. So we could be looking at the best horse in the universe. But if I drug that horse over to a man who owned a, like a car lot, a used car salesman, he's interested in horsepower. So I'm like, here's the best horse in all history. Is he going to value the horse? No, he's not. Because what he values is the car and the values that the car provides. But that doesn't mean there's no one in the universe that wouldn't just like flip over backwards for that particular horse. So when somebody is embarking on this process of trying to, you know, feel more you know, good about themselves, honestly, they have to look for what about them is, is a thing of value. And a lot of the times the thing that is part of us that is of value, we're not even recognizing, we take it for granted. You know, it's like, we may have a really easy time empathizing for example, but it just comes so second nature to us. We're like, oh, I just can't be pretty. But like somewhere in the universe, there's somebody who like their top value is not to have somebody next to them who's pretty. Their top value is to have somebody who's empathetic, for example. So, so once we're starting to like really notice these things about ourselves that are of value and we can involve other people in that too. Like, what do you like about me? You can do that with your friends. F fast example. You can write everybody you know an email and just be like, look, I'm, on a, I'm doing a weird experiment where I'm trying to figure out what my strengths are and what's good about me. What would you say if you were talking to someone else? <laughs> about <laughs> and have, me. And have, right. Yeah. And have <laughs> each one of our friends just send it back. And what you're going to start to see is these dominant themes, ones we may not have even recognized. But then it's about this process of ownership of those things, like right. to really own them. And if you really own them, then you start to advertise yourself with those things. And what you'll notice is if you have a lot of confidence around this one area and you're like that, I really own that. Like, I'm really, really good at that. You're not going to be competing in these other areas. Instead, you're going to be looking for who wants that thing. But of course, this, this scares us because sometimes it means we have to upset our social you know, dynamic instead of staying yeah. in a situation where we're like, no, you need to value me for this thing that maybe they don't value because it's not their need. Mm. That's, a, that's a very interesting perspective. I love that. That's really incredible. So you had also said that you know what the key to happiness is. <laughs> this is happiness solved. So let's solve it together. What is it? <laughs> well, okay. So, so there's a lot. I, I could actually, I, I should just do a book where I just outline all of these things. But um, <laughs> I think the key to happiness first and foremost is you got to care about it. And I know that that sounds funny, but most people are caring about happiness in a very roundabout way. Um, we come into a society that has a very, very strict idea of what's right and wrong, what's acceptable and unacceptable. And so the first thing that we have to do when we're born into the society is to adapt ourselves to that idea of acceptable and unacceptable. And it's at this point that we don't go directly for happiness. We do it in a roundabout way. For example, you know, let's say that we're raised in a society where we learn that the only acceptable thing to do is to help others. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, let's say that our happiness is doing art. We can't go directly for art because it's not helping someone. So all of a sudden we, we notice that we're taking actions that are counter to what would cause us to be happy. But it's our hope that in, this is the shortcut, or, or I should say the long way to do it. It's our hope that by, let's say getting a job as a nurse, and helping somebody that we're going to find acceptance and that acceptance will make us happy. Right. So it's almost like we're going around the back door, like over and over and over and over. And when we, what we find when we start to, to decide that what's really important is that we feel good. And that has nothing to do with despite others. I'm not even going there. Like we're not bringing the factor of other people or relationships into this. We're just saying for yourself to decide that what's important is that I feel good all of a sudden makes us be more straightforward and in the front door about happiness. And instead of trying to get it in these roundabout ways, instead of martyring ourselves out or trying to do things as a, so that we start to go straight, straight for it. And by doing so, ironically, even though we may have gotten ourselves into a, a social setting to begin with, where people will turn their nose up at that, we're actually hurting people a lot less by being straightforward about it. You know, we can kind of own who we are. And by virtue of doing that, we can really put people in the position to decide what's right for them, given that truth, you know? 
so that first that first key is to decide that that you feel good really matters and that you have to go for it directly. From there, I feel like the next thing that people need to do is to stop making it so so big and so broad, you know, because when we go at happiness, a lot of times we're, we're about the big stuff. I want to find a life purpose, you know, that's really important. I want to have a romantic relationship that's absolutely bliss. I, you know, it's just huge, massive things. And because we're so focused on those massive things, I think we get ourselves into a lot of trouble because we're always measuring ourselves according to where we want to be and we're always falling short. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of happiness that can be found in, I don't even want to call it the baby steps on the way to those larger goals, but it's, it's more like in these simple moments, there's a lot of joy to extract that people aren't extracting because, for example, a wonderful cup of tea that you're loving drinking isn't necessarily the best boyfriend you've ever had, you know, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that this is any less tasty. So learning to extract the little things of, of happiness and those moments when you're in them is a very important element of, of happiness. Yes. And I, I mean, everything you said was, is incredible. And I also feel like, like so many people, it's like, well, when I, when I get that perfect partner, then I, then I'll be happy. Ah. No, oh, and this is, there we go. Okay. So here we go. You just brought me to another one. So, that, so with this understanding of the way that the universe functions, right? Okay. I can tell you that contrast never ends. Now, yeah. I just did a whole talk when I was in Basel about this and was actually shocked at the reaction that I got because I stood up on stage and I said, I want, I want you guys to realize the contrast never ends. What I mean by contrast is wanted and unwanted, positive and negative. Like there is no end to this. Right. And that's an actual design. And everyone was like, what? Almost like, well, that was what I was going for. Most of us, when we talk about wanting happiness, what we're wanting is to never experience the negative, to never experience pain again. And I'm telling you, if you're going to walk through life with that aspect of that element of resistance, you will never be satisfied. Exactly. So, so let me explain to the people who are watching this, why contrast plays into the greater universe. In a contrasting environment, when you experience the unwanted, you give rise to the desire for what is wanted, right? And then let's say that you orient your thoughts, your words, and your actions in the direction of that thing that is wanted. When you do that, you're creating personal expansion and growth and therefore expansion and growth in the macrocosm of the greater universe. So it was an absolute design for contrast to never end and therefore for movement and expansion to never end. That means it does not matter. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter whether you get the perfect house, the perfect you know, guy or girl, the you know, perfect job. Standing in those places, you will always desire more. So what happens when you accept that though, and this is the beauty of it, like you can, you can go the Buddhist route, the Buddhists kind of recognize this and said, well, that's going to be the, the, the root of suffering for all time and eternity. So just learn to not desire. That's like going this way. Right. The thing is you can't, you can't undesire the desire to not desire. Okay. So, right. <laughs> or you could go the other way, which is what I'm trying to teach people because I think it's a lot, it's a lot more of a, like I said, a dynamic relationship with the universe it's to accept I will never stop desiring. That means I will never get to a place of endedness where I, where all things feel good. And if you accept that that is a part of life, then all of a sudden there's almost like a settling and you're no longer trying to get to this end goal to such an extreme degree. It's not that you won't create these end goals or desires. You will, but it's not with an attitude of, unless I get there, <laughs> I mean, that just vanishes. So then, then it becomes, all right, well, if I knew that even when I get there, I'm not going to be satisfied. And I can almost make it fun. Like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Then it changes your whole relationship to this game. So a lot about happiness is not about what you attain. It's about changing your relationship to the game of or the sort of game of attainment, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. It totally does. And I love, I love how you explain that because yeah, I mean, you, you have to have the contrast in life. And so many people get so caught up in why me, why me, why me, instead of, getting to a point of, you know, this happened for me, not to me. Yep. It's definitely yeah. a tall order when we go through bad enough stuff, but yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. And, you know, I know for me, I wouldn't be the person I am today if I had not gone through everything that I went through. And I'm, sh I'm just kind of guessing you're the same way, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. I love everything that you have shared with us today. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience to 
and, and how they can find you. Oh, yeah. I think the best way to find me is just go to tealswan.com. So as long as you can remember my name, you can find it. Perfect. Um, I put out a, a new video every single Saturday. I put out free content every Saturday on every nice. different subject under the sun. So you can kind of go down what people love to affectionately call the Teal Swan rabbit hole relative to any subject you're interested in, whether it's career related or relationship related or the greater universe at large related or healing. You know, I think that would be the, probably the best thing for people to do because I could sit here and talk all day long. <laughs> oh yeah. And I could talk to you all day long for sure. And I, I, I would love to pick your brain a little bit more. Um, it's just that I like to try to keep these short and sweet so that, you know, people actually listen to them. <laughs> Teal, this has been such an honor and a pleasure to, to get to know you a little bit here in the last uh, 25 minutes. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was good to meet you. Thank you. So good to meet you. <laughs>